Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased to be continuing our municipal series this week. And today I am pleased to be joined by, and I want to get this right here because she has an extensive resume that I need to make sure we address here. She is the second term mayor for the town of Innisfil in Ontario, which means she is also on the Simcoe County Council as a councillor. And as of December, because this is how much research I do on my guests beforehand, she is the acting chair of the Ontario Small Urban Municipalities, according to their official uh, minutes that were released on December 14. Please help me welcome Innisfil Town Mayor Lynn Dolan. Mayor Dolan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Brown. You really do do your research. Well done. Um, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this interview, I want to ask the question I've asked every single municipal or political person on the show. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Probably my father. Um, my father was uh, worked for municipal government as a staff level uh, in engineering and um, public works. And so from an early age, um, I got to understand what the municipal level of government did and, uh, and really, uh, hadn't considered it, uh, until he started nudging me back in the early nineties. So was politics discussed at the dinner table? Was politics something that was always discussed? Because I've talked to many councillors, mayors, and the range of, People who say it was never discussed and I got into it because I wanted to give back to my community or yes, it was discussed. And that's what sort of drew my interest was the discussion around the dinner table. Well, I would say not as much there, you know, maybe maybe political parties were discussed like provincial or federal politics was discussed at the table, but really not a lot about municipal politics and and, you know, which even though he was employed by a municipality, um, probably talked enough about it at work and didn't want to bring it home, I'm guessing. Um, I want to go back to that very first election that you ran in. And yet again, doing my research, 1994. Let's put yourself back into 1994. Was there an issue that was on the top of your mind that you said, I need to address this at town council in the town of Innisfil? And I believe my voice is the best one to address it. Or was there another outside perspective that said, Lynn, you need to go run for town council because we believe your voice would move our community forward? A, a little bit of both, really, okay. Chris, because... Um, yeah, first of all, I had my father nudging me. Um, he nudged me for the 1991 election, but I was pregnant with my son at the time. And I just couldn't imagine, um, you know, have, being a new mom and, and having the council role too. So um, at that time in 1991, uh, Innisfil didn't include where I lived. So uh, it, it was the township of Innisfil and it was the village of Cookstown. And uh, the Simcoe County Act um, was passed by the province and uh, there was a lot of amalgamations around that time. And uh, just, so my concern, I guess, was the little wee village, sleepy village of a thousand people getting swallowed by a larger township that was probably at the time around 10,000. Um, so we, you know, a little concerned about us losing our identity and, um, and, and so that was probably the reason that I, uh, that I decided to run at that time. Plus that baby that I was pregnant with in the 1991 election was, was ready to go to junior kindergarten and I was going to have all this time on my hands. So let's go back to election night in 1994. Um, it's always as you always remember your first election. I remember my first election in Clarington, Ontario, Newcastle, Ontario is where I'm originally from. Um, and I remember election night, my very first election, I was unsuccessful, but you were successful in 1994. What was that moment like when the official results came in and Lynn Dolan is heading to town council or township council as their next elected official? Yeah, I was, I was quite surprised. Um, really? Because I was I was, I was running against the incumbent. Oh, okay. So, 
I was like, well, I'll uh, knock on a lot of doors and I'll, I'll, you know, learn from this experience and try again in three years. So uh, I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't, I did work hard. I did knock on a ton of doors. And I think it's hilarious that you, um, that you're from Clarington because my father worked in Clarington. That's the municipality he worked for. So he started Small off world. in Oshawa. Yeah, he started off in Oshawa and then he went to Clarington and he retired from Clarington. And um, yeah, his name's Don Patterson, if you ever ran into him. And he worked in the public works sector for uh, Clarington for quite a few years. The name so. sounds very familiar right now. And I am flashbacking to all my connections I made over my time in Clarington. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was, again, very exciting. It was a long night, I remember, because it was um, at that time the paper counting ballots. And uh, I think it was about one in the morning before we opened the champagne. So, um, it was, it was a really exciting time. And I, um, I really, every, it never gets old. Every election is exciting. Um, I have nine of them under my belt now. And, um, and, and I learned something from everyone as well. Like, you know, we, we in Ontario moved from, we moved from a three-year term to a four-year term in 2006, Part of me likes it, but another part of me says you, there's never a time of year that um, that you get so much interest in municipal politics and get people talking about municipal issues than during election time. And then people seem to go to sleep for a couple of years. And then why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Because that is the big crux of what this show is all about. Yeah. So it's it's first of all here in Ontario. And I believe um after the Ontario election in October, there was one in PEI as well. Dismal turnout, dismal turnouts for municipal elections. And I don't know whether it's apathy or whether it's because, I mean, you're not voting for a party. Like people kind of have in their head, even though they've got local MP or MPP or um, I forget what you call them. M MLA. MLA. That the... Um, they're voting really for the leader in most cases in in provincial and federal politics, whereas in municipal politics, you have you have to do homework. You have to you know read up about the person and just read up on their campaign. And if they haven't knocked at your door and you're going off a pamphlet or if you didn't get a you know, people might say, well, I can't make it an informed vote. So why why vote? Um, I don't know what it is, but we have to fix it because it's it's not good. Um, here in Ontario, uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, we call it, is running a, um, a campaign now to try to get voter turnout uh, up for the next election. What was turnout in Innisfil, if you don't mind me asking? Do you know? Oh, I think 25%, something like that. Really? really. And like... One thing that other municipalities uh, had um, happen is uh, one municipality in Simcoe County had the entire uh, council acclaimed. Some have vacant positions still, still on council. We didn't. We we bucked the trend there. We had 26 candidates. We had a race in for every ward and for deputy mayor and for mayor. So we really bucked the trend uh, for that piece of it. But again, it was uh, it was a dismal turnout. And and yet, um, I had the impression ahead of time that people might that might have been more engaged. Like the questions I was getting at the door seemed like people were getting more engaged. But still, it's very very common. For me, not even during election time, but uh, I get phone calls uh, that are clearly not my, you know, sometimes about immigration, sometimes about uh, my my kid doesn't like his teacher, or can I get a school bus change? Change people who really don't understand what level of government does what. You have opened up a lot of Pandora's box here in this conversation already, and I want to dive into a few of them before we go into the town here. I want to start with uh, apathy, and I want to talk about how you said some municipalities and some uh, communities didn't have 
they had acclamations. They had people not run for certain positions. Do you think uh, municipalities and particular local governments are better served when you do have that race, when you do have that ability to run against someone? So you're both putting out the best ideas and the voters can decide which way they want uh, the town to move forward. Acclamations are fine. Don't get me wrong. I've seen people get acclaimed who have done great jobs. But when you run against somebody else, you're putting out different opinions. And sometimes the vocal opinions are what you need in elections. Yes, I, I think so. I think it's very important to um, educate people and make sure that they understand that, um, you know, how important it is. Like everything in local government that, that we do is like, if you shut down the federal government, unless you needed a passport renewed, you, you could go weeks before you even figured out that they were shut down. You know, if, if we didn't do what we do, the stuff that people take for granted every day until it doesn't work, until you turn on the switch and your hydro and your lights don't come on, you turn on your tap, your water doesn't come on, you go outside, your street's not plowed, um, you know, the library's not open, uh, your kid can't play hockey. Those are the things that people just assume uh, take for granted until they don't happen. And then they're going, what happened? And then you also mentioned a little bit about, and you just mentioned it there as well, the federal provincial issues. As a municipal councillor, you are the front line and you're going into the grocery store and they know who you are. The local grocery people know who you are if you're walking into the post office or the grocery store. And you're going to be swamped with a range of issues, whether it be federal issues, provincial issues, but you can't pass the buck. You can't say to the person, that's a federal issue because they've elected you and you, they want you to deal with the issue. How do you as mayor deal with that? Because I can imagine while trying to run a town, while trying to sit on the county council, you can't be trying to solve provincial and federal issues as well. Or have you found a grace period where you're able to do all these things for your residents? Um, I think it's just a matter of like some people <clears throat> just want to be heard, right? And if you're in the grocery store and they find you, you know, my kids would always say, no, mom, no, because you're going to be in there for three hours. Um, but a lot of times people just want to be listened to. And, and there's a way of doing it instead of just saying, oh, that's not my responsibility. You know, you can say, listen, uh, perhaps some advocacy. Is there somewhere we can advocate together to our local MPP and make sure she's aware or our local MP and make sure he's aware of this issue and kind of gently, you know, nudge them in the right direction? Because the harder thing is when the particularly the province, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, people expect municipalities to do it for them. So for, for instance, um, if there's not proper funding for hospitals, uh, people expect the municipality to step up and fund the hospital. Um, because does, that hurt, does that hurt municipalities like Innisfil? Because I can imagine when you don't have the proper funding and you're not the only community that I've spoken to about this issue where funding is an important factor when it comes to municipalities because people have to remember municipalities have to run a balanced budget. They can't go debt. They can't have a, they have to run a balanced budget. So how hard is it to balance those issues when uh, residents are looking at the municipal level to fix the issues that federal and provincial party or uh, government sort of, lay at their feet absolutely and most particularly the province because we are a child of the province we we exist because the province allows us to exist um and we have over 200 pieces of legislation that we must comply with mm -hmm. and and report regularly to um and we do all that with in ontario with nine cents of the tax dollar so of all of the money you pay in taxes, whether that's, well, you're lucky you don't, you don't have a provincial sales tax, do you? No. So we have provincial sales tax. We have the federal sales tax. We have gas tax. We have income tax. We have all of the um, taxes that, that you pay. Only nine cents of that comes to municipalities. And we have more infrastructure um, to maintain and repair and replace than the federal and provincial governments put together. So 
we know how to petty pinch. We know how to do things efficiently and, um, and, and we have to, um, like you said, we can't run deficits. Um, and yet the, the pressure on us to increase services, improve services, fill in gaps for what, you know, might be a gap from other levels of government. That's, that's what people expect of us. Is it a challenging, it has been a, a challenging last few years. I know you just went through an election last year in October, but the budget cycle is usually the most toughest thing that municipalities have to deal with because you kind of have to anticipate what the provincial government's going to do in their budget, but also you have to anticipate what's going to happen because we all didn't see inflation being a big thing that we'd be dealing with in 2023, but here we are. Are is the town of Innisfil, and yet again, I'm going in, uh, in the weeds here and I wasn't planning on it, but you seem like someone who wants to chat about this type of stuff. Is, is the town of Innisfil and even the Simcoe County Council ready for what's ahead for 2023 when it comes to rising infrastructure costs, rising uh, HR costs? Yeah, we're going to have some difficult decisions to make, but I have to tell you, after going through 2020 and 2021, <laughs> uh, everything else is going to be a piece of cake because uh, definitely the most challenging you know, I'm 28 years on council and um, I've never been anything, I've never been through anything like a global pandemic. Um, all the unknowns, all the navigating, all the pivoting, as, you know, from different rules that were going forward, you know, dealing with our community, making sure everybody, you know, we were dealing with them in a, in a compassionate way and nobody was being left behind. I mean, it was, it was definitely the most difficult, um, but also rewarding times we I'm so proud of our whole community and how we banded together and helped each other and and gave compassionate care and did did a needs assessment and filled in those gaps with food insecurity and all of those um, things so um, coming out of it is is also choosing to turning out to be a challenge and and the inflationary pressures on us this year um, so we're currently we we're we do a two-year budget cycle here. So we are currently um, navigating our way through that budget book. And, um, and we've got five brand new members of council. Um, we, had, we had three councillors decide not to run again. And then we had four running for two positions. So we have a we have a nine member council. And so five of those members are brand new, never been um, uh, sitting as a elected official before. Uh, so lots and lots of onboarding. We had five orientation sessions and um, very happy with, with, the, with the group. They're, they're keeners, they're in for the right reasons uh, and they're, they're fully engaged. And, and, and now we've got two full budget days where we're just going to be, okay, what are the must haves? What are the nice to haves? And uh, and then just like with inflation the way it is, just to maintain the level of service we currently have, yeah. we've got an increase. So and we took we did um, make the decision during COVID to come in with a to um, relook at our budget and we came in with a zero tax increase for one year, which you know of course that puts us behind. So because uh, everything if you have zero tax increase, then something's got to give. Um, but yeah, and, and it's just finding the right balance. So we've got repair, we've got, uh, new residents who've moved from larger municipalities in the greater Toronto area and moved up here. And, you know, they want the services that they got in the larger centers. So, um, so there's that, that call and demand for more services. Uh, but then there's also that call and demand to keep the taxes affordable. So it's it's a balancing act, and it always has been, and always will be. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members, has risen dramatically over the past handful of years, and to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. 
On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. So you're you're driving right into my next segment here, and that's the town of Innisfil itself. So before I ask this question, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a decision of council, because we've heard a few times that people send emails to me saying that's not what council's decided. No, it's what the mayor and I are talking about. It's her opinion. So in your opinion, Mayor Dolan, what is the biggest issue facing the town of Innisfil right now as of talking? So I would say unprecedented growth. Um, we are um, about an hour north of Toronto um, and we are looking at substantial growth. The province has, uh, has told us that they want to increase the supply of housing drastically. Um, right now in Ontario, uh, we issue probably about a thousand permits a year and they want that up to 1500 because they want, or sorry, a hundred thousand a year. And they okay. want it up to 150,000 because they want 1.5 million homes in 10 years. So that's a huge uh, growth area and we know that most of that growth will happen in and around the larger centers um, so we're looking at doubling our we've tripled our population since I was on council and we have we're going to be doubling our population at least doubling our population by 2051 so lots and lots of growth and lots and lots of pressure to grow um, and then most, most recently, uh, just around the same time as the election, our Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing um, decided that one of the ways that we would um, cut the red tape and get houses on the ground was to allow um, affordable housing and attainable housing to not pay the development charges that they have in the past. Um, development charges are the things we use to provide uh, the services that people need in a growing community, growth is supposed to pay for growth. And uh, so without those development charges, that growth then comes down to the cost of that growth comes down to the property taxpayer. So trying to uh, make sure that we grow smart um, and sustainably is, is the biggest challenge that we have in 2023, in my opinion. So, this is relatively new because the provincial uh, election was last May or June, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just trying to remember when I was last in Ontario because I was there for the provincial election. The, these new changes that Premier Ford and uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs Stephen Clark ad announced later this year. So cities are now trying to figure out how do we do this? And the hardest step in ever, ever answering that question is the first step. The first step is always the hardest because you have to kind of come up with a game plan. What is the first step for the town of Innisfil to grow smartly, but still achieve the goals that the minister and the premier have both set out for you? So we, we've developed a concept. Uh, we've dubbed it the orbit. Um, so we have um, currently uh, a GO train, go, our Government of Ontario Transit, it's a train, commuter train that runs through our municipality, and there's no stop. So you have to either go south to Bradford or north to Barrie to get on the train. So we've got a train uh, station now that is planned for our municipality. And what we're doing is we're building a transit oriented community. So um, if you Google the orbit, um, you'll see some, some really cool uh, artwork and pictures and concepts that are coming forward. So what we're doing is taking what I'll call a clean slate. 
so the the train station itself and we're building um in um we're building out in a radius and the first radius being about a 15 minute walk to anything in that community. So very walkable, we're gonna be using technology um, to make it a smart community as well. And it's gonna be very dense, uh, density like we've never seen here in our town. And we are, um, so with that, we're going to be able to absorb a large amount of the population in a smaller footprint, uh, which makes it more affordable because you're putting less linear infrastructure in the ground, you know, water pipes, sewer pipes, and also making it um, so that you're keeping the farmland, which uh, local food, which was, became so important to people during the pandemic and also green space and traditional neighborhoods. So you're not, you know, you're not butting up to a single family state residential place and putting huge, oops, I'm sorry for my phone ringing. No putting worries. Huge, um, huge uh, density right next to an established neighborhood, which really uh, annoys people. When we have public meetings, if you're building you can build a thousand units. Uh, and if it's not like in somebody's backyard, people don't care. You build five units with a, in an existing neighborhood and you have a thousand people show up to the public meeting complaining about it. So the is other nimbyism thing- Is live and well in Innisfil? Is nimbyism, li is nimbyism oh. live and well in your community? Absolutely. <laughs> Isn't it so everywhere? It's, oh, it's everywhere. <laughs> well, Minister Clark's got a new one now. He doesn't call it NIMBY. He calls it banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere. I forget how it all works. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, we do. We do have, have, uh, have that here. So as, how do you do that? And you know what? Because I can imagine that's tough because you as mayor want to grow your community. Your council wants to grow your community smartly. But there are some people, and let's call them the nimbyisms. And I'm not saying that everyone in your community is. There's probably like a small portion who are saying, no, we don't want this. We like the small town feel that we moved here for. We like the small town feel that we grew up in. We don't want it to change. How do you smartly grow a community like Innisfil to, A, achieve your goals of smart growth, but also achieve that small town home feeling? Yes, and that's that's exactly why we think the orbit is the answer because it's also putting in a product that we don't have. So right now we have uh, we have single family or townhouse development. So if you want to stay in the community, if first of all if you can't afford that, you can't live here. If you and if or if you don't no longer want the acre of grass to cut and all the maintenance and the snow plowing that goes with it. Um, there's nowhere else to go in the community. You, you have to move out. So this product, uh, the, the condominium products and will be something that will be more affordable for people say who work downtown Toronto because they'll be able to uh, buy a condo in Innisfil, walk to the GO train station and be downtown in less than an hour. Or, um, you know, with for people who maybe the, the, snowbirds that you know want to live near the lake and beautiful lake simcoe that we have here but maybe spend their winters uh, in the sunny south um they could just lock the door and um it, it just it makes more sense so and then it also allows our traditional neighborhoods to to remain to have that feel so that was that was part of the concept behind it because and there's detractors and to those people i say if, that, if not that, then what? Where do we put 40,000 people? Where do you think we should put them? If we keep doing the sprawl, um, it's just, it's not financially feasible to keep building, um, you know, homes the size on the size of lots that we have. And I don't know about, you're in Calgary, right? I don't know about in Calgary, but here in subdivisions, People don't use their postage stamp backyards. They don't. People here, if they live on a street, quite often uh, you'll see the a bunch of garage doors open, and you'll see people gathering in up everybody else's garages, like 
it, because it's the social front, right? It, it's a Canadian thing, I think, because that it happens out here as well. Yeah, and it's because we want to connect with people. And if you're sitting in your backyard the size of a po postage stamp, you, there's, you don't get any social interaction. So um, the idea being to um, also build these condos with lots of open air space, but also to have these public friction spaces that uh, where people can socialize and and uh, we call it placemaking and and you know whether it's a fire pit whether it's a skating trail whether it's a band shell um, places where people can gather I want to turn to our last segment because I'm cautious of time and I want to respect your uh, your time here and this is my favorite part of the segment because I'm a tourist. I love touring. I love traveling to different communities. I love experiencing communities up close and personal. With a large following across Canada and particularly in uh, Europe for some strange reason, hello, Germany and Ireland to the people who are listening. Um, if I was a tourist coming to your community, either tomorrow or this summer, because I know I'm going to be in your community this summer, what should I be doing? Uh we are so fortunate here. Um, there's there's no place like it. So and it's it's location, location, location. So number one, we have a huge, beautiful piece of the Lake Simcoe shoreline, and Lake Simcoe is a huge, big body of water, uh, and it is a recreational amenity like no other. Um, and if we're, we're also equidistant between the big city if you want to go to, you know, Blue Jays game or a Raptors game or, the, you know, theater, professional theater, or if you want to go to Muskoka, skiing and Blue Mountain. So we're just kind of right in the middle of that. And um, we have several marinas on the lake. We have an, a new uh, resort uh, called Friday Harbor. You'll have to look that one up too. It's a gorgeous uh, resort community with um, homes that are, um, you have your, you don't have a driveway, you have a dock in front of your house and you have a boat slip and um, beautiful scenery, uh, a gorgeous boardwalk, a nature preserve, uh, an, an astounding golf course and uh, all these amenities um, and a, the boardwalk has the, all this fine dining restaurants and shops to explore. We have, um, you know, that's kind of the more modern end of, of Innisfil. And then we have historic Cookstown, which is where I live. And there's the Cookstown antique market and all the little shops to browse in. And one of the best antique markets in all of Ontario. I may, my parents were former antiquers and we used to go to Innisfil all the time. So I know it quite well. Yeah, we, we are very proud of that. And then we have uh, an outlet mall now too there. So for, sh for shopping and then um, for the thrill seekers, we've got a casino, we've got a racetrack, we've got Sunset Speedway, which is car racing. And you can jump out of an airplane. We have a uh, parachute club too. Um, Putting that on course, the thing I'm doing this summer. <laughs> <laughs> golf courses galore, uh, a wonderful farmer's market. Uh, so there, there is so much to do uh, around our community, and and we have um, we have our beautiful Innisfil Beach Park, which is right on the lake, and there's walking trails, and there's a boat launch, and and of course this time of year, um, we're like the ice fishing capital of Canada too. We got tons of ice fishing. The uh, Lake Simcoe and Cooks Bay in particular is uh, famous for its perch and lake trout and um and it's dotted the shores are always dotted with ice huts so it doesn't matter what time of year uh, you come here uh it is just it is a wonderful place to be the other thing which you'd be surprised at is we have award-winning international award-winning libraries our library uh is called the Innisfil idea lab and library they have um they have a a purpose-built hack lab, they have computer labs, they have a full green screen room, they have sound recording and uh, where you can, they have 
all the musical equipment. You could have your band come in and record. Um, they, they have 3D printing and welders and you name it, they've got it. And it's also, you know, you can have a coffee, sit by the fire. They have a group that comes in to jam once or twice a week. They're just musicians, local musicians that meet there. So it's it's something else. We've got people coming from, I think Calgary came. I know um, Ottawa came to look at our library um, and Toronto came to look at our library. I think Calgary did too. So we're, um, we're really proud of, you know, our innovation that we have here, we have Uber as our transit system. So we have on demand 24 hour a day, seven day a week transit partnering with Uber. Uh, so lots of lots of cool stuff um, in our little town. So what's your favorite part after a stressful day at council, uh, just doing what you need to do to get by? Where do you go to decompress? Where do you go to just relax? Is there a park in your community? Is there a shop? Is there a coffee shop? What does Mayor Dolan do to decompress in the town of Innisfil? Yeah, so we have a lot of trails. We have a piece of the Trans Canada Trail go through. I've got a trail just outside my office door, the Rotary Trail that I can go walk on. And then we've got some picturesque trails down by, um, down by the lake. Uh, in the winter, we uh, light up some of the trees uh, in the park. And so I do like to, after work, go down there um, in the summer and the winter, in the summer to hear the, the, the waves lapping on the shore, but in the winter to look up at, at all of the trees lit up. So that's my, that's my uh, magic place to unwind. And my last question for you here, Mayor, because I am cautious of time. What makes the town such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, it's the people, right? I mean, you can build anything, but it's the people who make the town. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, during uh, the whole global pandemic, I was so astounded by how everybody looked out for each other. Uh, people were knitting things and leaving them outside their door pick it up if you need to we had uh, high school students cooking meals and putting it in our community fridge program that we started during um during covid uh we've got a, a group of people who um look after all the kids at christmas for families that can't afford it or backpacks to go back to school the compassion in our community is is palpable and um and it makes us it, i'm my hashtag is always love where you live and uh, the people here love where they live and they really care about uh, their neighbors and their community mayor dolan i want to thank you so much for taking the last 40 minutes out of your busy schedule and sitting down and talking about your community like i said i'm looking forward to visiting the town of innisville this summer and i'm looking forward to seeing that library up close and personal so i hopefully maybe even grab a coffee with you while i'm there <laughs> absolutely for sure contact me when you're here and we'll get together and i'll give you a little tour and I'll get I'll take a little pin as well when I'm there as well because I'm a I'm a big lapel pin fan. <laughs> All right. I'll I'll save one for you. Awesome. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. This has been the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>